Welcome back to part three of my Blender tutorial mini-series. We're manually making parallel noise and geometry nodes and picking up right where we left off in the previous videos. So go watch them if you haven't yet. Links are in the description below. Also, be sure to watch the original general math and game design video on Perla noise if you haven't already, as it provides some of the justification for the math here. In the previous video, we built up the backbone of the Perla noise algorithm and essentially made the four gradient maps that we now need to combine. The way we're going to do this is to lerp between the values in the cells and then use a smooth step function at the boundaries to remove the kinks. After this, we'll layer several octaves of Perla noise together to make fractal Perla noise. So let's get started. As a quick reminder from the video, the lerp function looks like this. Essentially what lerping is, is you take two values that you want to lerp between. You take the two values and subtract them, and this lerp value, this x, is essentially how far between them you've gone. Then you figure out that percent, and you add that on to the first value. In order to make the lerp function, all I gotta do is subtract, multiply, and add. So I'm adding a math node, subtract, I know the value coming out of here, we're gonna multiply, and the value coming out of here, we're going to add. Now we just need to link these things up and go ahead and group them. Control G. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give outputs over here. Value 1 and 2. And then I know I'm going to be multiplying by that third value, the X value. I'll go ahead and give them some names. There we go. I'll add in a little reroute node here. And then the value we're going to add is going to go here. Add another little reroute node and then hook this up to the output, and we should be all set. I'm gonna go back out, and we're gonna name this lerp, and minimize that, and we should be good to go. Now, because I've got this sort of area worked out here, here, and here as three separate things, I'm going to output my lerp values up here on lanes that I'm going to build, and as I mentioned in the video, I'm going to have to lerp things in a very specific order. In this particular case, I'm going to lerp the y's together and then the x, but you can do whatever you want, just remember you're going to be doing horizontal and then vertical or vice versa. So let's set things up. And then I know we're gonna do another one. I'll start off by plugging in these like this. One big gotcha here is reversing the positive and negative order. If you set one to go from top to bottom and the other from bottom to top, you'll get weird results. That applies here for this lerping, but it also applies for this lerping X here. Make sure you keep a consistent order and you should be fine. One way to check if you've got that sort of misordering is you'll have really sharp joins that nothing seems to get rid of between the cells where you've got the smooth gradient. Now we need to figure out what to actually feed the lerp function. Well, this lerp value is what you get after you take the x value or y value, depending on which one you're doing first, and you feed it through this function here, which is our smooth stepping function. So let's go ahead and build that. This is going to involve a bunch of math nodes, and the thing I'm going to be lerping across are the remainders here. I have a typo. How long has that been there? These consider the distance across the cell after it's been divided up by the octave, and in order to do this properly, we're also going to at some point need to account for that octave. So let's start building some of that out. In order to set these up, I know I have 6x to the fifth minus 15x to the fourth plus 10x cubed. By the order of operations, I'll do the power first, then I'll do the multiplications of the coefficients, and then I'm gonna do the adding and subtracting. So add a math node, set it to power, make three of these. The first exponent is five, second exponent is four, third exponent is three. Then I'm gonna do some multiplications. I'll need three of these. This one's gonna multiply by six, this one's gonna multiply by negative 15, and this one's going to multiply by 10. Now I'll do the addition and subtraction, except I've included the negative value in the multiplication here, so I'm really just gonna add all these together. So I'll add these two, and then I'll add these two, and we should be good. Now I just need to feed these to a value, so I'm just gonna set this up as a reroute node for right now, and connect it to everything. The next thing to consider is the octave. Now the octave value is going to go through the same process we did earlier, where we subtracted one to account for the fact that we don't wanna do any divisions at octave one. And we're going to raise two to the power of that octave to consider how many divisions we have. And then we're going to multiply that by this remainder bit here.
Now we're essentially comparing apples to apples. So now we're simply going to set this up as a group node. We're going to plug this in here. We're going to have two values. One is going to be the octave going here, and one is going to be the actual value that we're going to lerp here. Add a reroute node. We'll call this octave, and we'll call this value. Technically, the octave is an integer, but I don't care. Blender will figure it out. Now, there are two things I want to bring up. You can rewrite this so there are fewer calculations, and while that's not a terrible idea, I will say that I don't necessarily need to go through that right here just because this is such a small operation. The second thing is, we're in Blender, and Blender actually has a whole lot of tools that are here to help us with this sort of operation, and one of those tools is called the Float Curve node. With this, we can essentially do the same thing. We can make a curve, and this will do the mapping for us. We simply plug in a value here and we get a value out. And technically, this would do pretty much the exact same thing. The only reason I'm not using this, or rather the only reason I'm explaining this part right here, is because I intend this to be more of a mathematical and computer science-y sort of thing rather than a blender thing. That being said, this is a great alternative. You can even play with this to get some really cool shapes. The other thing I'll mention is that this is actually what's called a sigmoid function. Um, and this is super useful for a lot of things. My suspicion is that Ken Perlin did something where he came up with a polynomial approximation of a logistic curve, and this is what it looked like. At any rate, we're gonna delete this, head back out, and we're gonna call this smooth step. Minimize this. Remember the octave is on top, and we'll need two of these. Because we're going to be going from negative to positive, I'm going to be lerping the values starting with the floor, and then moving towards the ceiling, and I really only have to pipe the floor values going through these nodes here into the actual sigmoid functions. So I'll start with the Y on the bottom, and I'll put the X on the top. Then I've got to bring the octave over, so I'll do that. And I'll hook this in here. Now, I know I could just use another group input and grab the information from here, and that's also valid. This is just my preferred work style. I can look at this and understand very easily what's happening here, and it just gives me a sort of left to right flow. So if you like doing it this way, go for it. This is my preferred method. So now I'll create some lanes for the smooth step. Here we go. And now we have values that have been smooth stepped, and I'm going to feed those into the LERP function. The bottom one of these is the Y value, so it's going to go in here. And now for the way I have this set up, I'm gonna hook these in like this. I'll bring the X out and I'll hook it in right there. Another thing I like to do is to kind of get these curves to be roughly similar in shape, but you don't have to. That's just me being a bit picky. Now for the output section. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna take all of these and I'm going to duplicate them, bring them out, press X, and I've got to create three more reroute nodes for up here. So we'll just do that. Here we go. Now we'll just link everything up. Now we're almost ready to do this. The one problem is I'm going to mix up what these things are pretty regularly. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to separate them a bit and put some frames down with labels. So I'll do that really quick. And there we go. Now, at any time, I can go to my group output and hook things up appropriately. And all I've got to do is have something to accept that data and come up with some system in the main graph out here to accommodate it. So to that end, I'll add some things here. And there we have it. I have one output socket for the Perlin noise, one for a debug field of vectors, one for a debug field of floats, and just one for the mesh. I've also plugged them into just random things here just so that it's filled in, but because those are debugs, it's not really gonna matter what these are. There is one little detail. I'm actually going to add in one more vector at the bottom here. I'm gonna put the smoothed values here into a vector because it kind of makes sense that they could be one and it might help me with visualization. And there we go. If I need this in the future, it's right there. Last thing I'll do, I'll just put a frame around this. And that should do it. This is essentially the algorithm of Perlin noise. Let's go ahead and see what it looks like in the actual graph.
so this node should now be set up. We just gotta hook stuff into it. I wanted to take a quick second and just again explain another little thing I'm doing. The reason I'm splitting the grid count, size, and coordinates up early and sending a lot of noodles through is because otherwise I end up with a ton of these separate XYZ nodes littered all over the entire algorithm. For my own headspace, I simply prefer to separate them out early and create these sort of double or even sometimes triple lanes. It does take up a bit of space with this, but at least it's something that it's easy for my brain to recognize. I might have been playing way too much Factorio that might be factoring into this. I don't know, don't judge me. Anyways, so we know we're going to need a couple of details. One is going to be a string for the attribute and one is going to be the octave number. In order to do that, I'm simply going to create a value node for the octave and a string node for the attribute. Remember, the thing we passed into here was a string, and then we used that string to find attributes and do other things with it. So I'll hook that in here, and I'll hook the value for the octave in here. I'll give it a label. And I'll copy and paste that, because I'm actually just gonna use that as the string, and I'll do the same here. And I'll minimize these. When I know I'm not going to need this node for anything else, and it only feeds this node here, it does sort of obscure the noodles, but it actually makes organization a little simpler. So I like to do that personally. Now I need to bring in the mesh data. The seed is the top lane here. So I'll bring in the seed value. The cell dimensions are X on top and Y on bottom. So I'll put those in here. And the X and Y coordinates again are X on top, Y on bottom. And I could fuss with the fact that these two things overlap, but I'm not too worried about it. Now this is outputting the grid right now, but what we want to do is we want to have this octave data output. So let's go ahead and just plug that in here. The reason it's not showing anything is because we need to actually add in some subdivisions here. So we're gonna come in here. Let's go ahead and set shade smooth. And let's go ahead and subdivide this. And the subdivision noodle is the middle lane here. And let's go ahead and set the subdivisions to something like five. I'm going to turn off view wireframe. And we can see we get something. So I'm not quite sure what's wrong. We're gonna have to do a little debugging, but this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. We are going to need those noodles in order to debug. But we'll save the debugging for the next episode. I swear these cliffhangers just write themselves. Anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.